Chapter 33 looks at the animal body plan, basic form and function. There are three key aspects to animal body plans that it talks about. Some of the information is repeated from chapter 27. What this chapter looks at um, are the different types of symmetry and general body plans, bioenergetics and thermal regulation, and it really focuses on the four different tissue types that you see within kingdom animalia. So for body plans, there is a specific evolution to symmetry. The most basic animals, those in phylum Porifera, sponges, are asymmetrical. They don't lack any definitive symmetry. Everyone else, however, does, and there are two groups. You can either be radially symmetrical or bilaterally symmetrical. If you are radial, radially symmetrical, that means that your body parts are arranged around a central axis. You are wheel-shaped, think radial tires, that's where the name comes from. Um, so you can bisect or cut in half a radial animal um, as long as you're cutting down the middle, it doesn't matter where you cut, you get two equal halves all around. This body plan is evolutionarily more simple. If you look at the genes required to make a radial body plan versus a bilateral body plan, radial takes less planning. So bilateral, on the other hand, is when you cut down the sagittal plane. I cut you into left and right, and they're mirror images. Animals that have bilateral symmetry also have a head end, which is called cephalization. Their sensory organs are concentrated in one area of the body, and that allows them to be more effective unidirectional organisms. So they do better at moving quickly in a straight line. So for body shapes, sizes, and metabolisms, you have to consider the size of the animal that you're looking at. Small unicellular organisms are perfectly capable of getting everything they need through diffusion. They can take in what they need via diffusion and um, remove what they don't need via exocytosis. It just moves its way across the cell area. But in those instances, that means that cell size is really constrained by the area to volume ratio because you have, um, as the cell gets larger, that ratio really decreases, which means you're capable of getting rid of things a lot slower and you can take in materials a lot more slowly relative to your body size. So larger organisms can't have really big cells because it becomes really ineffective at removing dangerous things and taking in the good stuff. So you just have to have more cells. You have more of the little things, which means that you have to be able to provide all of those internal cells that aren't exposed to the environment with everything that they need. So as you get more of these cells, you add layers of complexity. So let's talk again about those body plans and the evolutions of tissues, because that's what you get when you start talking about complexity. Perizoa, the sponges, phylum uh, porifera, they don't have defined tissues and organs. They have the ability to disaggregate and aggregate their cells. I reference this in a different lecture video. If you put a sponge in a blender, and make a sponge smoothie and pour it back into healthy salt water, back into the environment from which it came, it will aggregate itself back into a sponge. Obviously, some of those cells would have been damaged beyond repair, but most of them will not have been, so you can just create a new sponge. All other animals have really distinct and well-defined tissues, and once a cell type is kind of given its job, once a stem cell has become a bone cell or a stem cell has become a nerve cell, it can't go backwards. Its life is then defined. For bioenergetics, how all these cells use energy, you have to um, go through anabolic reactions. You have to, to build things up, uh, build up molecules to store them and then break them down to release their energy. All living things therefore have a basal metabolic rate. And that's just the average amount of energy that an organism needs to survive. You need to be going through all of these reactions just to exist. You never truly enter stasis where you don't need energy, any energy at all. The unfortunate part about all these reactions that are constantly occurring is that excess energy, excess energy, excuse me, is given off as heat. The reactions are not 100% efficient and they're actually a little bit less proficient, efficient than the average car. Um, so we lose a lot of energy as heat, which is nice because it helps to keep us warm, but anyone who's ever um, been working out and gotten way too overheated, you're burning a lot more energy, you're giving off a lot more heat, you know how uncomfortable that can be. 
Oddly enough, when it comes to metabolic rates, smaller animals tend to have higher metabolic rates. Uh, they need to compensate for the heat loss because they have a relatively large surface area compared to their body mass. So they're constantly burning through energy. So when you, um, someone says, you know, oh, that, you know, she eats like a bird, she's so thin. Well, birds actually have a really large surface area, so they have a really high basal metabolic rate. So they eat a lot relative to their body size. And of course, the more active an animal is, the higher its basal metabolic rate is going to be as well. And that affects the way that its body is organized and the way that it can, that it can and must live its life. As we're examining animals and their form and structure, we have to look at body planes and body cavities. We organize the body planes um, different ways. They all have special terms. There are mid or there are sagittal planes. A sagittal plane is technically any any plane that divides a body into right and left. If you're referring to mid sagittal, that's a straight cut down the middle, so you have two equal halves. The frontal plane or the coronal plane, where a crown sits is where that comes from. It separates you from front and back, and then there are transverse planes. So that's up um, top and bottom. So like a CAT scan takes transverse planes, transverse cuts. If you are cutting at an angle, we refer to that as an ob oblique plane. If you're not um, an audible learner, visuals help for you. Here are all examples of those things. You can see that mid-sagittal plane in both of these organisms, it cuts them exactly in half um, left to right. The transverse plane cuts them top and bottom. So when you look at the goat, you're thinking, that's not really top and bottom. We can think about it as um, the entrance to the digestive system and the exit to the digestive system. The entrance is on the top per se, and the exit is on the bottom. So that's how you see that transverse plane. And the goat is a little different than the transverse plane on the human being that's standing upright. And then um, you see that frontal plane cutting that organism in front and back. So there are four types of multicellular tissues in animals. Epithelial tissue, epithelial cells is anything that lines a cavity or an open space or a surface and either protects or secretes something. And we'll look at specific examples of all of these things. Connective tissues hold things together and provide support. This is any cell that has an extracellular matrix that interacts with its environment. Muscle cells generate movement, control locomotion, and then neurons or nervous tissue generates and sends electrical signals. There are uh, a lot of different types of cells in each of these individual categories. We'll take a look at the epithelial tissue first. So when we're looking at epithelial tissue and we would like to describe it um, more fluidly, we look at the number of layers of cells and then the shape of the cell itself. So epithelial tissues can exist in just one layer or they can have multiple layers. If you're just one layer of cells and that's it, that's the whole lining, then we say that you're simple. If you have multiple layers, then we say that you're stratis um, stratified. We have different cell shapes. They're listed in this little chart, but we're gonna go through them individually because it makes it a little easier. So one cell shape is squamous. Some people say squamous. So that's the first line on this. So squamous cells are flat, um, but they have a kind of this irregular round shape. So they're not necessarily squares. That's a really common misconception. They're kind of irregularly round. They tend to have straight edges because they fit together a little bit better like that. But squamous cells can exist as a single layer, like what's on the inside of um, your cheek, or you can have stratified squamous cells, which is what you see uh, in this picture in the lower right-hand side. For stratified squamous cells, um, your skin is an excellent example. You can have cuboidal epithelial cells. So these are single layer cells. These tend to secrete things or they are, uh, so this is something like the inside of you know a sweat gland is, is a cuboidal, simple cuboidal cell. Columnar cells, columnar cells are also really great at secreting things or protecting things. In this picture, you can see two simple columnar cells. One is an actual tissue slide on the left and then on the right hand side you see goblet cells and they excrete things for you. That's where they have those big openings. Um, you can have pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelial cells. So we can get really specific. So we said before that if you're stratified then you have multiple layers. If you're pseudo stratified it means that you don't have multiple layers but at first glance you appear to. 
And that's because the individual cells that are all packed together have different um, shapes, parts. Some parts of them are wide, some parts of them are thin. So it looks like you have multiple layers, but you actually don't. In this case, these are ciliated. You can see all those little tiny hairs on the top. So these would be excellent cells at moving things across them. So all those cilia would wave and you could move things across them like a mucous membrane in the, the inside of a stomach. So you have lots of cells for absorption, lots of cilia for absorption, but they're still moving and therefore moving whatever medium is on that other side. Our connective tissue. Connective tissues consist of cells that are embedded in a non-cellular matrix. They have that extracellular matrix. The matrix is usually composed of something called a ground substance. The ground substance is it's a mix of a whole bunch of things. Collagen fibers, elastin fibers, something called reticular fibers. But in general, connective tissues are used to connect other things to each other or to give your body structure. So we're talking about collagen, bone, blood, um, your dense fibrous connective tissue. So that's, again, what you see in collagen. You have loose or areolar connective tissue. That's what's around your blood vessels and helps to anchor those epithelial cells to whatever they need to be anchored to. Your fat tissue, technical term for that's adipose. That's actually considered a connective tissue. It sounds really weird to say that your fat connects things, but uh, technically when you're talking about what connective tissue really is, that's exactly what fat does. Here's some images for us visual folks in the upper left-hand side. You see the different types of blood cells. Macrophages are white blood cells. All of the large cells in those pictures, those are your different types of white blood cells, of which there are five. The little round bagels, the little round red bagels, if you can see color, are your red blood cells. And then all those tiny little flecks that look like grains of rice are platelets. The picture immediately to the right of that um, looks like chicken wire. That is adipose tissue. To the right of that, you see elastin fibers, fibroblasts, and collagen fibers. That's a loose connective tissue. Um, you have bones on the lower left-hand side and then some um, dense connective tissue on that right-hand side. And then that's hyalogen, hyaline cartilage on the lower right. So you have lots of different types of connective tissues that serve many different purposes. The study of tissues is referred to as histology. One of my favorite classes I ever had the opportunity to take. If you ever get a chance to take histology, I would very, very, very strongly suggest that you do so. Tissue type um, number three are the muscle tissues. So you have smooth muscle tissue. That is involuntary. You can't control your smooth muscle. Your smooth muscle is what you find in your organs. So it's what's moving your stomach, moving your digestive system, things of that nature. Skeletal tissue is what you can control. That's what's moving your body around. In some instances, you know, if you get a, a cramp, you might not be thinking about moving your skeletal tissue, but that's what's innervated by your nerves and you have the ability to move it. And then your third type of muscle is your cardiac muscle. And thank heavens we don't have to think about moving that one. That's your heart muscle and it moves entirely on its own. We can tell these muscle types apart by looking at them um, by how they appear. So skeletal muscle has striations in it. Those are from the actin and myosin, the sarcomeres, the joints that cause the skeletal muscle to move, make it look striated. So we see these lines. When you look at it under a microscope, striated skeletal muscle, it looks like it's got you know, zebra stripes. Cardiac muscle has these intercalcated discs. discs. Um, my histology professor once told us that cardiac muscle looks like skeletal muscle that someone tweezed apart with tweezers. They pulled it apart with tweezers and he couldn't have been more right. Skeletal muscle in this um, cartoon picture doesn't necessarily look like it, but if you have the opportunity to look at it uh, under a microscope, it really does. Or if you look it up online, it looks like skeletal muscle that's been tweezed or pulled apart and it's got these thick intercalcated discs and that holds the individual cells together and allows them to contract with a whole lot of force without actually damaging the cell. And then smooth muscle cells, the name kind of implies it. They look really smooth. They still are obviously moving their muscle cells, that's their job, but they don't have those big thick striations that you see in skeletal muscle. Next, but last but not least is our nervous tissue. So nervous tissue um, is nerves 
and neuroganglia. So when we look at a nerve cell, you can see one up here. It has a main body to the cell itself. And then there are long communication tendrils that pull from that nerve cell, referred to as axons and dendrites. They can have different shapes. Some of them are protected. You can see that sheath material, that blue wrap around that axon material that actually allows these cells to communicate a little bit faster. But the purpose of your nervous tissue is to generate and transmit electrical impulses so you can share messages across the surface of your body. When it comes to these four tissue types, technically speaking, not all animals have all four tissue types, uh, but your complex animals do. You have four, uh, anyone who's in a, a vertebrate is gonna have all four of these tissue types, at least at one point in their lifespan. When it comes to animal form and function, kind of one of our big function is to maintain homeostasis. We need to maintain our temperature. So homeostasis aims to keep internal conditions around a set point, and we don't wanna to move too far from that point. This is not just a reference to temperature. You have a set point, um, for example, for your pH, your body's pH does not wanna move you um, are perfectly healthy between 7.35 and 7.45 on the pH scale. Anything outside of that, you get very, very sick very, very quickly. Even if you're drinking the, you know, the fancy pH water, which is terrible for you and a total crock anyway. Um, if your liver and kidneys are working just fine, your pH is just fine. Any change from a set point, though, and what your body prefers, you know, solute concentration. If you've ever heard of someone getting water drunk, they are their body is hypotonic. They don't have enough solutes in their body. Or if you, when you're dehydrated, that's the other side of it. Your body is hypertonic. You don't have enough water. You want a specific pH. You want a specific temperature. You want very specific internal conditions of things like magnesium and potassium. Um, your set points can change over time. Some of the health conditions that you will study if you have the opportunity to take like A and P classes. So one of the set points that your body's really worried about in homeostasis is your, um, your blood pressure. And something in your body, an illness in your body can, can cause your heart to consistently maintain a blood pressure that's actually not healthy for the rest of your body. Thankfully, nowadays, we have medications that can help us reframe that set point. Um, and uh, kind of re to reframe that set point back to healthy. So not all heart conditions demand that you maintain a super consistent uh, medication regimen. You can get better. There are other other instances of that too where you your body hits a new set point because of an illness but thankfully nowadays with modern medicine we can correct that one of those examples um, or some examples of this that kind of mess with our ability to maintain homeostasis or negative feedback loops we're not always good at controlling these so for example I eat a cookie and my blood um, glucose level rises in an individual that does not have diabetes, my pancreas, me for both my parents are diabetic, I am not. So when I eat a cookie, my pancreas is going to release insulin. In response to insulin, the cells that are capable of taking in glucose and converting it into glycogen, which is the long-term storage version of glucose, um, will do that. They'll go ahead and they'll do that for me and my blood glucose levels will fall. And my pancreas, because my blood glucose levels fall is then going to release something called glucagon and because of that um my body if i need it will actually re-release that glycogen and allow me um, to use it if i need it i will break the glycogen back into glucose and my mitochondria use that glucose to turn it into energy so that's an example of a feedback loop so we have a set level of glucose that we would like in our in our blood we have um, ways to take in that glucose and to store it for later, and we have ways to release it. Some other examples of things that our body like to control, again, are temperature, your glucose level, your blood pH, and then your blood calcium levels. All things that our body is actively working to maintain homeostasis and thermoregulation. There are some positive feedback loops. So negative feedback loops push us back to a set point. Positive feedback loops will maintain and potentially strengthen um, 
a response to particular stimulus. There are not a lot of these because they tend to cause really big things to happen. An example is something called oxytocin. The release of oxytocin um, will cause uterine contractions in pregnant women, and that's gonna push the baby up against the cervix of mama, and it will stretch. And the stretching of the cervix, it uh, starts a nerve pathway and it sends a nerve impulse to the brain and the brain says, woo, this, the surface is being pushed on, I need to release even more oxytocin, which causes even greater contractions, which causes even bigger pushing against that cervix and even more signals. So you see this big positive feedback loop where the stimulus is building and eventually baby is born, cervix is no longer being pushed on and the body returns back to normal. We need to maintain relatively constant internal temperatures, largely for our enzymes. If you've ever done an enzyme experiment where you, you know, cooked or cooled an enzyme and, and you found that it wasn't as effective outside of a really specific range, that is why you need a really constant uh, internal temperature. Your hypothalamus in human beings is gonna help control that. We have ways, of course, to heat and to cool ourselves Naturally, physically, you shiver, you burn calories, um, you use your metabolism to release energy when you're cold. When you're hot, you sweat, and as the water evaporates off your skin, you know it takes water with you. We're really concerned about these internal temperatures to protect our enzymes, because once you denature an enzyme, uh, you can't always put it back the way you got it, which is why it's so incredibly dangerous to get heat stroke. And here in the desert, of course, most of us know all about that. There are, of course, some animals that are ectotherms. They can't control their uh, internal temperature entirely on their own. They have to use the environment to help them do that. Again, to reference our lovely um, uh, desert life, when you see the lizards that are out sunning themselves, um, they, they're they cold. They need to, to increase their temperature and they use the sunlight and the hot rocks to do that. And when it gets too hot, they go in the shade and they cool themselves off. So temperature can be maintained um, a lot of different ways depending on the organism. It just depends on what animal you're studying. And you'll have the opportunity to look at that as you look at some of those animals in more specific instances, which is in our other chapters in our study of biology.